Hi, everyone. So great to see so many people here. Uh, we're really grateful that you chose to spend this hour with us, and I'm um, very grateful that Michael Ward is here to present. Um, if you haven't been in a session with Michael Ward, you are in for a treat. It's going to be an hour of some great power of prompts. Um, and if you have been in a session with Michael Ward, you know uh, why we have so many people signed up for this webinar today. Uh, it's great to see so many people that uh, we've we've seen here before and we've worked with and some new folks. Um, Hello, New Jersey, state of New Jersey and state of California. Great to see you all. Uh, and, and just by the way, for the state of New Jersey folks, I don't know if you know, we are uh, registered um, with NJ Start. So that kind of makes it easier for you guys when you're booking training and so many other people here. This is wonderful. Okay, well, let's we'll go ahead and get started in a moment. Just wanted to all to let you all know that this is being recorded and we'll be putting this up on our YouTube channel. Uh, we'll also be putting up on our, putting it up on our site at our uh, like celebrate.com slash library slash videos and we'll also be emailing you a copy. And just to let you know a little bit about Accelerate, we've been in business for 19 years, but uh, my name is Anne, by the way, um, and I've been with Accelerate for 11 years. Uh, we do teach a lot of training all over the US, worldwide, and now, of course, online. And so since we've converted everything to online in the past year, we've actually um, had a lot of really good feedback about it because we can flex the schedule for you. We've had a lot of success with half-day courses, or maybe you just want classes on Tuesday or Thursday, so we can more easily accommodate that. Um, but other than Webby, we do teach um, programming languages, data science, JavaScript libraries, um, Microsoft applications, and a lot more. But of course, today we're here to talk all about web intelligence. And if you go to our site, accelerate.com slash business objects training, you'll see a handful of classes. Um, but if you've got a team or three or more and you need anything customized, we can work with you to do that. Um, we can teach online. Uh, we haven't had too many in-person requests yet, but I, I have a feeling they'll be, they'll be coming back. Um, but if you're just one or two people and you need training, we do have open enrollment on our schedule now, and these are half days and they're coming up in June. Um, so if you know that you want training and you're just one person, um, I would go ahead and sign up for that uh, fast um, because whether you choose the in person, uh, I'm sorry, whether you choose the the team customized or open enrollment, Michael Ward is the instructor. We've been working with him for about a year or so now, and he is our go-to trainer for all things web intelligence. Um, people love his classes. He has a ton of experience. He's a great presenter, um, sought after all over for user groups and um, and meetups. And uh, I'm going to turn this over to Michael, so you're gonna you're gonna see why. And uh, let me go ahead and give you the power, Michael. Okay, that'll be great. Great, okay. If you give me the uh, show my screen, which should work good. And I think everybody can see my screen. I can get yes. that Yep. Yeah, can it? Thank you, Ann and Mike Cullen, who helps with the setup, sets up for all of our remote training so that you get into a server to be able to do extensive hands-on. Uh, it's great to be here again. We've got a great turnout again. Uh, I love presenting to large groups like this. I know you always get some value added out of it. But if you want to come back for more, sign up for the training. People are asking for longer sessions and handouts and stuff, but you get all that in the in the regular training class. And you get about 40 best practice guides that we put together on a variety of awesome topics to, to kind of fill in the gaps, give you more examples, give you little hints and things. And they come standard with the with the Webby training classes and they're the best way to learn. Uh, can be very inexpensive. You get a large group and you need to get that training. If you are, 4.2 SP 7 or 8 is the service pack level you want to be at. If your company is there, you're in getting all the latest and greatest. To be honest, 4.2 SP 7 was the last release that had enhancements. 4.2 SP 8 was what we call the bugs release. They call it fixes, but we call it bugs. We know what the software vendors really should call it. So, But it has a lot of the latest and greatest features in there as well. So welcome. Let's get the show on the road. I ginned up an example to give us a little bit of a head start. I could use more than an hour, as you probably would guess, for a presentation, but well, this way gives us a little bit of a jump start. We're going to talk about prompts today, and prompts are awesome. They're a great way of allowing you to build a report or right up front when the user opens up a document or refreshes a document, they get a prompt for the values that, that they've set the prompts up for. And why is that important? Because otherwise, you're going to have filters in there that are hard-coded. 
which means every time you want to change the values, you can't just refresh the document and just pick new values. You have to edit the actual Webby report. Take that all out of it so that I have it dynamic, and then anybody can run reports or refresh them. In fact, you can even schedule your reports to run at, at, at night, in the morning, every day, every week. If you've been through my training in the advanced class, we talk about the scheduler, and it has an allowance that recognizes prompts and said, oh, hey, wait a minute. Before I schedule this for you, why don't you tell me what you would like the values to be? Ah, okay, so some really, really cool stuff. But prompts have some real power built into them. And remember, prompts are done up front. I call them global level filtering. It's done up front at the query level. If you want to bring it down locally into the report document itself, which we call the report viewer window, after you've run the query and you get your report coming up, that's where you would want to use input controls to set up local prompts. Think of input controls as an extension of prompts, but they're done locally within the document itself to allow us to do dashboards and, and uh, visualizations and all kinds of linking and stuff as part of it as well. So let's get into prompting. I've got a report I already set up and I've saved it. There's a reason for that. Um, so let's go back and, and, well, you can see the output from it. I picked three major folder groups. I picked up year, state, and lines out of the infamous uh, eFashion universe that we all get tired of. Come back to the query panel level and it's nothing magical there. I turned off my uh, preview window because I don't need that, okay? And I'm doing a lot of work in 4.3 now, getting ready for you down the road. The query panel has some similarities, but some significant differences as well, but this very straight and forward. And the problem we have here is we don't have any filters and I want filters. I want query filters, but I don't want them hard coded because I don't want to be in the editing business. I want to give it to my staff, show them how in view mode only, not the full Webby, they can just refresh the document and change the prompt values. So let's do that. That's a query filter, but it's not a static one, it's dynamic. So we're gonna grab year first. Year can be grabbed from on top or on the left side here. You drag it into the old query filter box here, okay? And it defaults to in list. As you know, the operator's window, in fact, almost all query filters, except for two, the is or is not null, all have an object, an operator, and an operand. The in list versus equal to battle that we all go into, the most common one, and equal to means my user will be able to pick one and only one. But with an in list, they can pick as many as they want. And there's a lot of different options that are single or multiple value as well. Normally what you would do is select in list or equal to, and then you'd come into the window and you would select values from a list. I don't want values from a list. I don't want it hard coded. I want it dynamic. I want it to prompt me each time. So we pick prompt, okay? And by setting it up as a prompt, it puts a default message in there for that one. It says enter values for year, for year, okay? If I want another one for state, I can drag state down. And just as a, some, one of my many best practice pointers, when you bring an additional object into the query filter window, don't drop it on top of what's there. If you have four or five filters already there and you play a little game with ands and ors, you're gonna have an issue. It could over drop on top and change the and and or logic. So, so I just put mine underneath at the bottom, so it pops up underneath. Now for state, I don't want an in list, I want an equal to. What does that mean? Right out of the gate, no matter what type of prompt they set up, in list means they can pick one or more, equal to means they can pick one and only one. And let's make a prompt for that one, okay? You can set up as many prompts for as many objects as you want. And you don't even have to have them in the, op the, uh, the available objects up here for the, the um, results objects window. I can filter on other objects, I just don't get to see those in the report. So we'll select prompt again. So now I have two prompts. That one says enter state, notice the verbiage. Webby has a little bit of smarts and says, well, enter state means single value because of equal to, but enter values with the S in there for year. Our last one we need is lines. Let's drag lines down into the window here. We'll leave that one as an in list as well. And why don't we just go in there and let's just set up prompt and we'll make them prompts as well. Now you can have prompts that are actually pre-built, what we call predefined filters. If you've been through my training, you know those well, and they have little yellow filters over here. There happen to be a few that are out there. There's one for uh, uh, prompt for line item, which category, which product. So these can be also, even though they're prompt statements and not hard coded, they can also exist at the universe level. Now, you need to be a universe developer with the UDT or the IDT tool to do it, but they can be built in for you as well. So we've got this pretty well set up to go. We've got our three prompts. And by the way, the order you originally set them in when you run it, I'm gonna go up to the right-hand corner and run it, is going to be the default order of the prompts. I'll show you later on how to change the order without deleting them and recreating them. 
which is what typically will happen. So the first time in, you're always going to have the prop window come up with it's going to list all the prop props that you've set up for each of your objects in the order you originally created them in. And there's a little red arrow saying you owe me a value for year, you owe me a value for state, you owe me a value for lines. Without at least one value, I'm not going to get off that window. Notice on the right side, we happen to be in the year. It shows me all the existing values. It does have a freeform area up here. You want to be careful. I don't want to put 2022 in there and have that be my only year filter because I'm going to get zero records. So you have to think about things like that. Okay. Uh, so we could pick a value. Maybe we pick 20 and 21. Now remember, it's in list, so I can pick just one if I want or more. Then I go to state. State window comes up a little different, though. Yes, it gives me all the values. Yes, I can do a free form, but it's only got one slot. Why? It's Webby's way of saying, hey, you have an equal to for your uh, operator. An equal to means you only get one. So I'll just pick Colorado. Then I go down to the very last one here, lines. And I might be, I want to pick lines. Well, that's, that's the name. I don't want to just change the sort order. Uh, let's pick city, city skirts and city trousers, I guess. I didn't make these up. Credit these to Bill Gates many years ago when he set up the three demo uh, databases that we all use. Notice I have three green checkboxes. I'm ready to go. Notice it also has an asterisk up here. And the asterisk said it's required. You don't put a value, you don't get off the prompt window when the user refreshes or runs the report later on. We're going to talk about that in a minute as well. So we do an OK on it. We selected some values. And it's going to come back and it's going to filter my report based on the values that I selected. And look what I get. Notice we had selected 2020 and 21. We only selected Colorado and we picked two lines, city skirts and city trousers. They were anded together with an and connector, which means intersect. And there we go. Now, what happens if I go up and refresh the document here? Yeah, I can go back to the query panel to do it, but I can also do it from right here. I click to refresh. Watch what comes up. Much to our surprise, I don't get three prompts with three red arrows. Suddenly, it's got a green checkbox. A green checkbox, a green checkbox. And what did it do? It brought the values forward from the last time that you ran this report and selected your values. That's the default position. That can be good, that can be bad. You give these to somebody on your staff, and every Monday morning, they're supposed to change the values in the prompt each week, and they kind of miss it. Maybe a long weekend, and the next thing you know, you're getting the same report this week as last week because they didn't bother to change the values in here. Oh boy. Okay. So let's talk about some of the different options that are available to make our prompt, a simple prompt more than just a simple prompt. So let's go back to the query panel. And you'll notice for each one of my three prompt statements, there's an extra button right here, and it's the prompt properties button. And every prompt has that. So we click the prompt properties button here, and it comes back with a window, and this is just for year. We're going to repeat this for state, and we're going to repeat this for lines later on as well. First thing, let's do just to simplify things. You can change the prompt message to whatever you want. I'm just going to change it for simplicity's sake to select years. Well, be nice to type it in correctly, whatever you want it to be. I wish we had more space to work with, but we don't. Colon space, and I'll put a select years colon. We'll do it for that. There's my value for my new prompt message. Then let's look at some of the properties that are available and let's kind of look at how we can use those to our advantage. First of all, prompt with a list of values is the default. That means always show me the values every time. What if you're working with an incredibly large database developing a new report and it's so huge that when it tries to load your prompt window, because it has to search the entire database to build that distinct list of values for this requirement here, it times out. It happens a lot. So here's a way where you could uncheck it, at least for development then run your reports and actually put the values in, one, two, or three values manually to get around it temporarily. But generally, you want that on. One other situation where you probably would not want to have that on is if you're using wildcarding, the wildcard symbols, the underscore, or the uh, uh, the uh, one that's the other for the, law, uh, the right or left side, as I like to call it. But we're going to leave it on. Keep the last value selected. There's one that I always like to turn off. Don't do me any favors, Webby. Don't remember it. I want my users to have to think each time. What about select only from a list? Well, this is years. How can you screw up years? But look at product lines. We had accessories, city skirts, city trousers, all these. After my 23, 24 years with the product using the same universes that we've updated, of course, I still don't spell accessories correctly. So for certain type of objects when you're prompting, you may not want them to select 
from a list uh, to be able to input, but you only want them selecting from the list of values. Let's do that here, okay? So that means they cannot freeform input a value. They can only select from the list of values, and it won't remember the last one. We're going to leave optional prompt till later. You're going to love that feature. And if you want to set a default value, this comes up a lot. Well, I want it so whenever years the year prompt comes up, it defaults to this year or maybe last year, whatever. So if you do decide to set a default value, you've got to hit the values button down below. And then as it brings up the list, depending upon equal to versus in list will determine how many default values you can have. This is going to allow me as many as I want. So I could literally pick all four as the default if I wanted. For state, I'm only going to get to pick one because of equal. For product lines, I'll be able to pick as many as I want. For the prompt properties, this is for the default value as well. So I'm going to cancel back. Just be aware that you you um, you don't have to, but that is an option. Now, where the question comes up on this one frequently, and I want to remind you about this, is if this is a date field you're prompting for, a full date, a lot of times people like to have set the de default value to today's date. Not hard-coded, not Cinco de Mayo, not May 5th. They want it to be today, something more generic. And there's a cur date function in the function library that does that. Unfortunately, you cannot stick a value in here for the default values. It doesn't allow you to put a variable in there. Only values. However, there's always a way to get around it. In the IDT information design tool, which is one of the tools for building universes, they have a feature that was enhanced a long time ago, where if I build this, or if I'm a universe designer, and I build it as a predefined prompt over here, when I define the prompt at that level, it allows you to actually put in a variable, for example, cur date, so that it would automatically, as long as I pull that query in, that predefined filter to do it that way, it'll work. I just can't do it myself. So that's important because I get a lot of questions about that one as well. So we turn some things on, turn some things off. We already changed the message earlier, so we'll go past that one. Okay. So we'll close that one out. Now we go to state. Each one has its own prompt properties button here associated with it. Again, we don't want the last value selected. We only want them selecting from a list. And we want to say enter state. We'll just do it. I'll leave it the way it is. Enter state. That's fine. If you wanted, you could set a default. What did I warn you about with default values? When you go to the values button, because this is an equal to for the operator, I can pick one and only one. Okay. It's working correctly. That's what it should do for the default values. Okay. So we took care of our second one and kind of meticulously work your way through. And this can be time consuming. I've got three simple prompts. I've got customers with 10, 15, 20 prompts. Okay, so it is important to get these different settings the way you want. We haven't touched lines yet, so we'll just do lines real quick. And we don't want the last value selected. In product lines, I certainly want them selecting only from a list. If you're prompting for, for a, a value for an object that's like a year or something that's short, abbreviated, whatever, that's great if you want to allow freeform input. But for product lines with accessories, city skirt, city trousers, long string-based values, it's too easy to mistype them. So in that case, I would say select only from a list. I probably would have been okay with year. I didn't want to do state because I didn't want my user confused. Is it the abbreviation or the full state name? You know it's the full state. So the little things that could come up as well. Set a default value. Okay, that's good. We could if we wanted to, but we didn't. Okay. So now all I did was change each of the individual properties. That's it. Now I come back and say, well, let's run the query. I'm just working on 4.3 and updating our training a little bit, and the run query is at the bottom. So excuse me for jumping in the wrong place. Literally this morning, I was in 4.3 trying to sort it out from 4.2 here that we're in right now. And notice it came up, and it didn't remember the values from last time. In fact, there's three red arrows saying, you got to do it all. There's no freeform area for year, and I got to pick something for year. So maybe I pick 20 and 21. And by the way, this is one of the very few areas in Webby where you can't drag across. We can drag up objects left and right all over the place, all throughout the product, both in query panel level, and report viewer, but not when we're being prompted for values. Oops. So we go to state next. Now state, I can only pick one, but it didn't remember the value. Maybe I'll pick California this time to be different. And I go to product lines, which requires it. Now I want you to notice something about product lines. It's a long list of values. Right, not super long, but it's a fairly long list. If I hadn't shrunk the box down, which is we'll move it back the way it was, you're not really sure you see them all. What if I wanted all the values? Then I have to select every one of these, either individually or I can do a multi-select using controller shift and use the arrows. But the point is I have to get them all. What if I didn't bother to scroll down to the bottom and I was up one or two too high here? Let me do this. And I I didn't bother to scroll. I missed this here, and I realized well, there's a couple underneath. I still, I have to select 
all the values on this side, use the arrow to get them across in order to see all the values. It's too easy for me to miss them. What if it's 50 long or 75? You end up with gaps where you miss values. I'm gonna show you a little trick, a little feature to take care of that one as well. And there is a binocular feature to search through the list that way as well, okay? So we didn't pick a value yet, so let's put in just, what do I got? City trousers and maybe leather. It doesn't matter, it's a couple different values to have more than one. Got my green check marks, prompts are still required. Now I do an okay. And I come back at it and there we go. And my values have adjusted accordingly. We could have had default values for the prompts initially, which would have worked in well as part of that as well. Okay. So, so far so good. Now let's go back. And let's talk about some other things that are very important here. Number one question that comes up is I need to change the order of the prompts. You drag them up and down, left and right, or I shouldn't say left and right, up and down all you want, but it's not going to physically order them. It does it based on the original order at the time when you created it and ran it. However, up on the left up here, many of you might be familiar with on the query panel, this is the view script button. If you want to look at the SQL, including your prompt SQL, you wonder what the prompt statements look like. The next one is query properties, and this is important for a couple different reasons. Let's click on that. And then what it shows you in here is the name of your query that it came from, which you can rename. Come back for, uh, we do a multiple data provider example. I like to rename these to map to each of the query sources, but you could change them in here. And then notice here they are. What if I decided I wanted years to be moved down? So I let, oh, didn't move years down the right way. Let's move years down one, which puts lines, years, and state. Change the order around, make it something like that. Some other general settings that are available as well. Now when I do an OK, let's see what it does when I run the query now. And remember, upper right-hand corner, not upper, not lower right-hand corner. The version differences. And notice it now, select line, select years, select state. And it just got them in a different order. You may not think that's a big ticket item, and trust me, I, it's huge. It's a huge thing with customers that build complex reports, and they have lots of prompts, and they want them in a particular order. What if I'm trying to organize things at the state level? state and then everything else underneath it so i'd want to have my state picked first not in the middle so to make the corresponding prompt selections on the other ones that kind of correspond to that one okay so we want to think about that let's go back and put them back in the original order which is done easily enough here we saw they were different so i want product lines at the bottom state in the middle years on top now the other thing i want to show you that also comes into play which is very important is to limit the ability to limit the number of rows. This is really important, really important. What if I set the maximum number of rows to seven, just on a whim? What does that mean? Well, the limits feature allows you to limit the number of rows that it brings back from your data, from your query. Could be a database or from Excel or whatever, but it limits the number of rows that get brought back, okay, in conjunction with your prompts. So I might select all years, all the one state and all product lines, which gives me, I don't know, 30, 40, 50 rows. But this is going to limit it to the first seven. So it does work in conjunction. Okay. So now I run it. And let's see what happens here. Okay. So I rerun it here. And we'll pick, uh, maybe we'll just pick these two here. Maybe for state, we'll pick uh, Colorado. Just have one. For product lines, we'll select one, two, three. So I picked a good mix, a, a bunch of them, all two years and state. So I should easily get more than seven rows of data. So I do an okay on it, typical selection. And it comes back, whoa, I guess I didn't pick enough of the values. There we go. Let me, re, let me uh, rerun the query. I needed to make sure that I got all the values or more of the values than what we had. So for years, what I'll do is I pick all four years, well, multi-select, click those to the right for that one. And for state, we'll pick um, California. I can only pick one. And for product lines, we'll pick uh, maybe one, two, three, pick a whole bunch just to get a bunch of values over there for that one. So easily more than seven rows. I usually uh, don't run into that, but I guess I picked too small of a subset. So now it's going to run it. It's going to come back with more seven rows. But what happened was it capped it off at the first seven. Well, did it the seven in conjunction with your prompts? Or if you had query filters, it would have done it based on the query filters as well. Or lower right-hand corner here, there's a little yellow triangle. You probably can't even see it, but it pops up a message that says partial results, partial results. 
that's telling you that you had a governor kick in. And how can this come back and haunt you? I had a customer in New York City, one of my customer right over the years, and someone had put a restriction like that, not within the query itself, but at the universe level, to 10,000 rows. Nobody knew, nobody ever knew what this little triangle message in the right-hand corner was hard to see. They ran reports for nine months, and suddenly somebody questioned it, and it turned out to be they weren't getting all the data. When they found out what was happening, they finally found out that the 10,000 rows that was maxed was 40% of the data. They're making decisions on you know, a much larger base, thinking they've got all the numbers. So you can't forget about this. It does remind you, it's really built as a development tool. So if you're developing a new report against a huge database, do you need to run against hundreds of thousands of rows of data? No, you don't. You know, so you have the ability here to limit the number of rows, and it will work in conjunction with any others that you have as well. So don't forget about this feature. And remember, it can be done at the universe level by universe designers. And if they don't document it properly, it can be easily missed as well. Right? That's another thing you want to watch out for as well. So now, so we're going to rerun it. Got all of our things going on here. Oh, another way we can do this, by the way, let me go to the left side up here. Oh, I got to do this on the, uh, I got to run this. Okay, and let's, we'll have to pick some values. One of the things is I have to put in a value, but that's okay. Then we'll put in product lines. Maybe three of them. And we'll select those across. Now that I've got them all fulfilled, I can do an okay on it. And if I want on the left side, there's an additional feature up here with a little question mark. It's called use prompt input user. It allows you to create a different look to the prompts that come up. And here's what it does. It shows you the values, show your list of values for years here. It'll show them to you, uh, enter state. And you can use this as an alternative way. So from here, you could pick, um, maybe I wanted two of these values that were selected for state. And I can drop them into the window here. And I can run it with those. Just provides an alternative way of, of, of supplying it. So if you go back to the advanced window on it, it'll actually run it with, and bring up the, your traditional response instead. While you do it here, instead of the, the tiny little way I did it over here. So it's a little bit of a headache for that one. I don't like that necessarily like that feature, but it is available as an alternative for uh, displaying your prompts in a little different order for that one. Okay. Now I want to get into a very important, subtle, but important feature as well that I, that I glossed over on purpose. Let's go back to the query panel. And it was a, an additional option called optional. And when I clicked on years, okay, there was a feature that allows me to do optional prompts. So I'm going to turn that on. This is a very important one that was added in as an enhancement. Couldn't even tell you what's earth pack level. It's so long ago, but it's there. Most people aren't familiar with it. I can go in and I can select the second one for state. Make that one optional as well. Then I can go back to the third one here and make that one optional as well and do an okay. Now, what does that mean? I've made them all optional. It's a very nice way of setting things up. Then I go up to run the query and it behaves a little differently. And what is it doing? Let's take a look. Notice it's got select years, select or enter state, and enter values for lines. I left the two default prompt messages there in itself okay but they're green you're saying well how can it be green i haven't selected any values we made these optional this was a huge huge enhancement one that we had been requesting of the developers for a long time my friend samuel polachek they were able to come through for us a long time ago and they came up with this feature called optional so what optional means is if i leave it blank the assumption is give me all the values so if i pick a year only give me the years i've selected but if i don't pick any years assume that i want them all so what's going to happen with years, it's going to do exactly that. If I don't select any values, it's going to automatically assume all four. Now, notice it doesn't show the values. Well, how can I change my mind? All right. Only when you make them optional does it do this. It does not automatically display the list of values. You just have to hit the refresh. It's for efficiency. It assumes that many times you're going to leave it blank. So why waste the time caching these in for you to just ignore it anyways? As long as you don't select anything over to the right side, you're good to go. So we're going to leave years blank. We're going to go to state. Now, state, we have a problem. We have to think about this very logically. Okay. Let's hit refresh values for state. Here's the, the dilemma that you face with this one. Okay. They can only pick one state. That's a requirement. What if this is a customer-based report or a patient-based report? 
And you only want the user to be able to pick one patient or one customer at a time because they're developing reports and you don't want the reports reflecting multiple patients or multiple customers, all right? So we come into here and if I do pick a value, I can only pick one, okay? And I'm gonna pick California. But if I leave it blank, it's gonna give me all and it kind of goes around the, the concept of having an equal in the first place. So if you have any objects that, you, that you're working with and you set the operator to be equal to, and you are making it optional, understand what that means. We have a way of getting around it if they leave it blank. So for California, I would turn it off. I wouldn't do the uh, optional prompt for We'll leave it for demo's sake, but I wouldn't do it for that one there as, as, at all. Okay, and product lines, again, I have to hit the refresh. And I'd have to select now. This is why you want to have optional prompts when it's a long list of values. We all, I don't know how many we have here, maybe 12 or 15 values, but remember how they didn't all show up? Okay, they don't all show up, okay? But I need to select them all. Uh-oh, how am I gonna select them all? Well, I gotta go up and down, you know, I gotta go up here, and I gotta scroll down to here, and I gotta use my controller shift, either one, one at a time or whatever, and select them and get them across. So this is an awesome feature when you're dealing with large lists of values where the users tend to pick all of the values. That's what you wanna remember this one for. That's why this one's so important for this one. I'm not gonna put them in there, but if I did click the arrow to move them across, they would uh, would have been on the right side, and then it would give me all the values. So think about that one. That is very, very important for that one. And I didn't pick any lines. I had the window up, but I didn't select any onto the right side, so I didn't see them there as well. So you can see it only did California, but all the years and all the product lines for those as well. Okay. Another interesting dilemma that often comes up with prompts. Let's talk about this little feature. I need to see the value. What if I want the value for year? I want to be able to put in the header. Let me move this down. Oh, didn't quite get it right. Where's my four-way arrow? What I want to be able to do is for each of my prompts, and I'm just going to do one of the prompts just year, but for each one of these prompts, what I'd like to do is display it in the header and say year selected and show the values that they selected with the prompt. It's going to be different each time. Put one for state selected and to list the state or states that they selected, because remember, if it's optional, they might have picked more than one and do the same for lines. Well, there's a function in the function library built just for that purpose, something we've had a long time in this product, even back to the desktop days. And you said, well, what's the big deal? What if this report was 30 pages long and I need to know what years were selected? Depending upon the sort order of the report and not being in year order necessarily, it'd be scattered all over the place. So what we can do is let's create uh, an actual, we're just gonna put an empty cell out here. So we'll go up to report elements, we'll select cell, We'll select blank. This is the tab you got to be very careful about. When you go to report elements, it assumes you're dropping a template out there of some type. Here we go. I, I just click to release it. Puts a blank cell out there. What that blank cell is going to hold, it's going to show just the names of all the, I'm just going to do years in this example. All right, for right now, I've got to make it bigger, of course, quite a bit bigger. I could have made it a variable and dragged it in, but with the formula, the formula window is easier to see. So what I want to do is for the prompts, I want to be able to capture Whatever, whatever years they selected and display it right up here. And I could put verbiage in there, year selected or years colon. We'll do that later on. So we got the cell highlighted. We're going to use the formula editor since we're not doing it as a variable directly, which I could have and just dragged it in. And what you're going to find, and I got to go down to the right category for it, and it's under data provider. This is one of the very popular function areas is the data provider, one of the most widely used along with date and time. Uh, I've done presentations on that one. You might be interested as well. You get a lot of it in our training. And down near the bottom here, there's an option called user response. Right there. There it is. As with all functions and operators and whatever else you're clicking on up in the formula or variable editor window, it gives you a little bit of help. And here's what it's telling you. It returns, it returns a string, which is a list of values you, that you selected. And here's the format of it. All you have to do for this particular one is you just have to say user response and in parentheses, the exact prompt message. Remember ours said enter years colon for that one. So we're gonna do that here. Let me double check it first, by the way. Let me go back to make sure what the prompt is, the exact text. It, it says select years colon, okay? So I, since it's gotta be on the other end, I'll just rerun it. Could have just closed it without, but we'll just rerun it. And what we're going to do is we're gonna create a formula to do exactly that. We'll just leave them all blank. I don't care, I want all the values anyways. Doesn't really matter. 
We're going to take advantage of this. And again, it could have been a variable that I drag up to the top of the report instead. I'm just going to do year only, but we could have also done it for the other ones as well. So there's our cell. And let's go up to the formula editor and take full advantage of it. And again, it's in the data provider area. That's the particular category that it's in. It's one of the most popular. And all I need to do is bring in user response. And there it is in the window. And then I got to put in double quotes and it said select E L E C T. It's got to be exactly the same upper, lower, everything that I put in. Colon space and a double quote and a right parentheses. Okay, and I can check that. I always want to check it. Should be correct. Oh. User response, select years. So let's take a look down here where it's telling me the string. We're going to do more on this function. It allows me the ability to take a look and see what it's doing. I often mix up single and doubles and separators, but we'll take a look at it. It gives you the online help for every one of the functions that are there. So what's nice about this, you can go down and look and see what's going on. Okay, so if you use your user response with cities, it's double quotes, whatever around it, using user response for that. So we've got the help for us, which we can close. You need to use that help. It helps guide you through these problem areas. I think what the problem is, I got an extra parenthesis, it looks like to me. So select years. Yep. It said it's correct. And then up, well, let's drop this into place first. And if it's not displaying the value, that means I did something wrong. Well, we, it was, uh, so let's, let's just run this. We'll refresh it. We'll let it pop the values in for us. And usually if it doesn't match exactly the way it's spelled, upper, lower case, I'm trying to see if I mistyped it. It would do it. We'll bring it in. And it's typical to have one for year, one for state, one for line, somewhere in the heading or on the right side, left side, wherever you want to put it, you can put it. And it works out just fine. Here it is. User response, select Y-E-A-R-S colon space. I might not have the space in there. Let me try doing that. Try it again. For the cell. So I'm guessing, the, let's open up the formula editor, take a look why. We do these all the time. Select years colon for that one. If anybody out there can see my, it's hard to read it, but there's my user response. Let's take a look at it again. It's just the literal strings for it like we did it. Values. Formula is defined correctly. Select years. I took the one space out to see if that'll do it, but it doesn't look like this is automatic. I mistyped something on it. Well, get out of here. Let's see if it'll drop it into place. And if not, I'm just going to recreate it. Sometimes it'll you'll get funny characters get got in there by accident, and you won't know. So we'll do um, user response equals U S E R. It does recognize things and it will pop up as user response inside the parentheses. We got to put in uh, double quote select years. Space double quote. I knew I put a space in there, but I wonder if that's getting trimmed along the way for that one. If it doesn't pop in. Should normally drop it right into place. There it is. Select. I got a, I got a double A in that one, so that's why. Let me. You can see how it's very specific, just to the prompt only for that one. And it doesn't, it's just not picking it up there for some reason. I wonder why it's it's correct. Just something I've got wrong on it. Select years, it's no ECT, Y A R S colon. The other way you can go back at it, it is defined correctly. It would just it would just list the year values. And they're separated by semicolons. Select years, colon. Yep. It looks correct. It's just not uh I want to pick mine up. That's okay. We know what it's supposed to do, and I showed you through the online documentation how it can pop it up there as well. So uh, let's do this. Just to simplify, let me just pick two values. 
I'll just put a couple values in there. Sometimes you see weird things happen because I left it blank for all values. I'm sure that's what is a contributing factor to it. And there you go, that was it. A little nuance, wasn't a bug, wasn't a problem. When I left it blank, it gave me all the values because of the optional prompt, but then it didn't display the values. And all I got to do here is to stick some literal text up front. This is really easy, watch this. And again, this could have been a variable instead. And you just put your literal text, double quote and say year, years selected. Well, if I shift it on the keyboard in the dark, got to make that message look correctly. Years, S-E-L-E-C-T-E-D, colon, space, and then a uh, closing double quote. And the plus symbol is the concatenation character in Web, if you don't know. You know, going to come into my form as a variable section, you'll find out. So I got your selected, a literal string in front, double quote around it. And no errors. It's always good to test it. Now it comes back and it says year selected, 1819. And it does separate them by semicolons. But we found a routine one time working with one of my customers out in California, the California franchise group out there. I know some of you are in there, Tina and all. One of my students in there, real sharp guy, showed us, he built a little calculation to take this and do a line feed carriage return. So they go down on top of each other instead of across. Pretty slick. He also generated a random number generator function that's pretty cool. If you ever need either one of those, you can email me, we'll get them to you as well. All right, so let me go out and save this. And what I wanna show you, the last thing I wanna show you is in a really neat feature. Most people don't even know it's there. It's been out a long time, it's called prompt variance. What if I wanna create uh, prompts for each of my states? And for each state, I wanna have a different set of default years and default lines. So I pick California, Maybe I only want 18 and 19, and I want just two product lines. If I pick Colorado, I wanted to find a different set. Well, imagine if there was 10 of them. So what you can do is this. It's when you create the document with the prompts initially, you have to save it once, or it will not work because it's got to be able to store the variance that it's creating for you automatically. Think of it this way: it's a way of of presetting a, a block of prompts with a name associated with it. So it automatically, when the prompt window comes up, it pre-populates for you with your values, and you could say for each state, literally. So here's how we do it. We run it. This is really cool. I'm amazed how many people don't use it. And after you save the document, suddenly you see something up on top called available prompt variants. Okay. So what we'll do this for one th for starters. So we're gonna go on, we're gonna pick 20 and 21. And we're gonna pick our one state for California, refresh the values. It's one time when I don't like having the uh, that way. And then for product lines, if it's California, uh, we'll refresh the values. And we'll pick dresses and jackets. So what I would like to do is I would like to pre-store all three of those settings based on state so that whenever California, when they, they put in California will be kind of the, the separator. If they type in California, then they want it to automatically put 2020, 21 put in these lines, and you can have other prompts that are automatically set as well. What you have to do is you have to go up here and you gotta give this group a name, it's a prompt variant. So you go up here, there's a little disc button, hard to see. You click on it, it says, give me a name for it. We'll call it California. Okay, and I can change the values to whatever I want because maybe what I had set originally, I want to change my mind. And I do an okay. okay. And now, if you look up here, there's California. What if I do another one? I said, well, let's take California. Let's make it Colorado instead. Maybe for the years, 2020 and 21, let's add in 2019. And then for the dresses and jackets, we'll add in city skirts. And I wanna store this under the generic name Colorado. It could be patient information instead or customer, whatever. I go up and I just hit the disk button now that I've defined them. And it allows me to change them again. And this one I'm gonna call Colorado. This is a major feature, I better, better spell it right. So it looks like it's supposed to work. C-O-L-O-R-A-D-O for Colorado. And again, I can uncheck these and change the values, whatever I want for those. So now I've got California and Colorado. So if I come in, I can say, let's select California for my value. 
And this list will grow and grow and grow as you set more of your prompt values and then use the save button and give them a different name. So you could literally have 50 different states with 50 different combinations of years and product lines and any other additional ones should you want those as well. All part of that flow for you right there. It's really nice. We call prompt variants. Where did that come from? User community. People like you out there that said, you know, I have like a master set based on my first object's value. So maybe it's a department with a bunch of defaults for each department. It could be anything. You could add additionally into the header to display the values as part of it as well. And lo and behold, there you go. So that's called user response. A great way of capturing the information. Okay. One other thing I also want to show you that ties in with, with uh, your filters and your prompts and so on is let me do this. Let me do a right click, add report. We're adding a new, new report tab, a new sheet. It's going to be empty. If you go to report elements under cell, under predefined, we have this awesome feature called query summary. Like everything in report elements, it becomes a piece of dump stuck to your shoe. It said, what do you want this summary to be dropped? And what it does is it gives you a raw dump of all your critical statistics regarding this document. There's only one query. So it says query name, name query number one. It's universe e fashion, last date, time, duration, and so on. And it's got all your values that were selected being displayed in here as well. This doesn't replace user response. That was nice in the title. But what a lot of my customers will do, they'll take this. What I'll have you do is double click on the tab name, call it stats. Okay. And then when they create their report, so I have eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 report tabs, and the last one will be stats. It'll be this. And they'll refine it, make it look a little nicer, maybe create their own variables to capture that. But what's nice about it, it shows them all the filters from the prompts as well. Yet one more way of displaying for us, you know, the information as well. And literally, we, we can capture the, the, the values for all of these with three separate user response variables that we could create on the left side and drag them into the header instead. Number of rows it brought back, duplicate rows on, uh, query definition, what was brought in, how long it ran, uh, what date and time it ran on. This is default. This is comes standard. It's just out of the box called query summary. You know, if you look in the predefined, you'll also see one for drill, well, not we don't want drill filters, Report filter summary will show you any local filters, but here's prompt. So if I pick prompt summary, and I could stick that on the same tab, maybe to the right side over here, and now you have a prompt summary. So maybe you don't want to build a separate variable for each one of these. I would, because I want to put them individually in the header on the first page. But these are standard out of the box features. It's really cool that we have all this available to us that we can use to add to our report. So it's truly a stats tab. It gives you statistics, and it gives you, and because I picked the prompt one, it gives me all the prompts. If I would have picked the other one for a report for the report option that was available in here, it would have given me any local filters on the report side, report viewer side, report filter summary as well. All these neat, great little features that Webby gives us to try to help us make our life easier as well. Okay. All right, I'm going to stop there and open it up for questions. I threw a lot at you. I'm sure we've got a lot of good questions out there. I'll take any or all questions. I don't have a time constraint if you, uh, if you run over a little bit. If something that I got to research and get back to you, I'll be happy to as well. Don't forget about our training. You get, get an opportunity to do some of this stuff in class, especially advanced query stuff. We do a lot in our training for that. Multiple data providers requires an even better understanding of queries and managing those as well as part of it. So, um, Anne, why don't you... Uh, yeah. <clears throat> So I'm, I'm looking at the questions panel. You do have a couple. I'll, I'll, I'll read them out. But I just have to say this is a really sharp group because and I didn't want to interrupt your flow while you were doing the demo. But there were a lot of um, a lot of suggestions in here, like uh, optional prompt, but nothing selected. Uh, put put in prompt values. Anyway, there are a lot of a lot of really good um, sh sharp answers here. Uh, but I do see this one question. Um, they they have SAP, but they're not sure how to get that prompt menu. They're not trying to get the prompt menu. Well, what you have to do, I'm on the query panel. At the query panel level, you have to create a filter. But instead of selecting a hard-coded list of values in here, what you normally would do when you're building it is you're, you're going to select the individual years and hard-code them in. You would do values from a list, and you get a value from a list that are going to come up, and you have to pick them. Well, I don't want that. By making it a prompt, selecting the prompt option, I got to cancel this out. That's not going to work. But by making it a prompt instead, which it's defaulted to select years, 
enter state and enter lines. Now it auto it's automatically, every time I run this query or refresh this query, refresh it at the document level, it's gonna automatically bring the prompts up. That's how a prompt works. Okay, um, but he's, he's actually saying, sorry, um, Paul's saying, um, how do you actually get to this menu in SAP? The one that's up right now, right here? Yeah, I think so. When you run when you run the query, there's two ways. At the query panel level, you can run up here. There's your standard run query. Or if you're in the report viewer, you don't have to come back to the query panel. Okay. When I'm in the report viewer window, I can literally go right up here. There's the refresh all option. You might see it up in the left-hand corner, but also on the data access tab, there's also a refresh. This allows you to be selective. So if you have multiple queries in this document instead of one single source, you can selectively refresh one and not all of them. Or if you refresh all over here, even that, whether you do it here at the query panel level, when you refresh it, the prompts are going to automatically come up every single time. Just okay. a matter of defining the filter with a prompt for the operand. That's the trick. Got a prompt for the operand. Okay, and um, he's also going to reply offline. And so info at accelerate.com will work if you need to get in touch with us too. If like, you know, you just need a little bit more guidance there. Um, but yes, if if something's just just not clear, you can definitely let us know. Um, so let me just go to the next one here. Um, is there a way to use wild cards? Yes, you can wild card with prompts, but you got to be real careful. You got to be real careful. When you have your prompt statement for it, oh, I'm on the wrong slide. I was going to bring up a different one there, but let me go back to here. Wildcard can be used. It's going to be wildcarding is used here. Let's let's go back to the query panel. It's part of the query filter condition itself. And the way that that works, which is different, you can still prompt for it, but let's bring lines in just so we have a wildcard option for it. Let's drag lines into the window. When you do wildcarding, you must use one of two options or it will not work as wildcarding. Matches pattern. Or different from pattern so I could do matches pattern okay and then I could do a prompt for lines in here set a prompt and what we're going to do is we want to we really should do well that'll prompt you for the value in enter values uh, let me go back I've done this one example before I'm trying to remember how I edit it right here let's see nope because it's not a function of that. So let me let me research that one. I have an actual example. So okay, and he just says, for instance, states that start with C. C, the line. So I could do is a C, um, with the wild card front end or back end on it, C percent. So I need to start with C percent. Let's see what it does. We'll try it that way. Been a long time since I've done that one, but and I know it works because I've done it. It's a dangerous one. Yeah, it didn't treat it correctly. Yeah. Oh, I did it on the wrong one. I was doing it on states, that's why it didn't. So let me uh yeah, this one's yeah. Well, usually there's two things you want to do. You want to turn off the prompt with a list of values. And then you want the prompt text to be uh, C percent, that's what it's going to come back with here. Except this is not supposed to be lines, it's supposed to be on state. What do we got? We got some that'll work here. Let's do A percent. The wildcard character for the front end or back end is a percent symbol. So if I were to do a C percent, which would be California, uh, uh, I'm sorry, percent symbol, yeah, that's the wildcard character on that one. I've done this before. I'll pop it right in. So if I go to state product lines here, and the values for lines. Oh, it's waiting for the wild card. Yeah. Let me get back to you on that one. There's a trick to do that with that one because I've done it before for students in a class that required it. But it does. I yeah, and we're record all the questions are recorded with the the person who asked it, so we can definitely get back. So I, I, I flagged this one. Good question. Yeah, um, there's a way to do it. I don't know. I'll I'll just double check on it. Let you know. Sure. What you could do um, is I got my email address there just for a second. I popped it up. Sure. So if you wanted to drop me a note on it with the question directly, there's a way to do it with the prompt sequence. I actually have done it in class before. So let me let me go back through that one and double check it. 
All right. Um, uh, here's one. Could you please give an overview about hierarchical prompts, like prompt hierarchy? Prompt hierarchy. All right. Yes, I can. By default, it's unless you set it up, it's not going to do it. So the best way for me to do this is let me show you something brand new for it. This would be a very straightforward example. Okay. But it's not done at the prompting level. The only way prompting hierarchy works is if it's defined in the universe, UDT or the IDT. IDT is an easy way of doing it to put it together. But I'm going to show you one level in. So what if I said, well, I couldn't do it at the at the query panel level. So how do I do it at the report level? I'll just show you real quick how this works. It's a real easy example. And it, it's very powerful. So uh, it was a 4.2 SP5 or 6 feature. And I'm going to make it real easy for you. We're going to be doing input controls is what we're going to be doing. But to show you that hierarchical cascading effect. So even though you can't do it except at the universe level up front, but you can build it into your document itself. And this is worth, that's a good question. It's worth showing. It's on the report side, but it, you have to carry it in for that reason. So let's make it real simple. Real simple, state, city, store, three level hierarchy. Here's my state, there's my city, there's my store name, they're not linked together in the universe, so I'm, any cascading is not gonna work. Oh, I brought in too many objects here, by the way. Double click too much, didn't want that, didn't want that, didn't want that, didn't want that. State, city, store name, and let's throw in some measures. If you're running HTML, as most of you are, double clicking on the folder gives you all the values. We'll take discount out. Okay. State city store will run the query. And we'll show you. This is really slick. This is really cool. It was an enhancement that most people don't realize is there. It gives you, the end user, the ability to create your own cascading list of values. That's the key. What I want is I want to have a filter for state, so filter for city, filter for store name. I can't do it at the query level because I'm in the report. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go up to the top on analysis. And we're going to create an input control for state, one that allows me to select states, one that then allows me to select city, and one allows me to do store name. So we'll do state first, okay? Select the input control, and we'll leave it on state. This is your simple input control builder. And we'll make it a combo box, which means you can pick only one state, but it would work if you did a list box for multiples. We'll let everything else default. Nope. Going to ask what level do I want it just on this report tab or throughout the whole document? If I select the whole document, any additional tabs that have state on it will automatically be filtered. Little extra things you want to keep in mind. So there's my state one. Okay. Then I'm going to go back, create another one real fast. So just bear with me. We'll do one for city. And we'll do a next, and that will make that a combo box also. Current report. And they all have to be the same. If one of your three is going to be current report, they all have to be as well. We'll go to store name last. We'll create a quick input control. It's really easy to create these. They're the driver behind creating interactive dashboards and visualizations. I got some good stuff on that one as well. And we finish it out. So here's the problem that we run into. Okay. Um, so let's bring up my input controls on the left side so that input control windows open up right here. Okay. And there they are. So what if I pick state, standard input controls? And I said, I want California, okay? So what I'm expecting to see are only the cities that exist for California, and then I'll pick the store names that exist for that city or for that state. The problem is you come into Webby, you come into your input control, and it lists all the cities across all the states, right? They're not linked or tied together. That ain't gonna work. Then it makes it even worse when I go down to the store name level. I need to have some type of a relationship, some of a cascading effect built into these. I'm not a universe designer. I can't do it inside the universe. In the old universe, it's a little bit more work than the new one. So what I do instead is this. I said, well, we've got all three of them opened up. All right. Up on top, there's a new feature. And again, this is 4.2, probably SP6, I would guess. What was it, 5 or 6? And if I hit the group button, it says, I want to group those together. This is all you have to do. And you go to the right here. We could call that new group our state hierarchy, whatever, but we'll just leave it alone. You select which ones you want grouped together, state, city, store name. This is literally all you have to do to create true cascading. For the states will give me the cities, which will give me the store names, but only for their parent value. So now watch what happens here. This is so cool. So I come in, and again, prompting doesn't support this. So this is one of those things where you, since you can't, you bring it in here and do it in here. So now I come back in again, and this time I do pick 
California. I want to go to the cities. Oh, it only shows me LA or San Francisco. I'll pick San Francisco. And then when I go to the store name, you come in there and I can only pick the stores that are there for, for, for the uh, city, for the state. And again, if I had picked list box instead of combo box, I could have picked multiple combinations. It does have a reset on top right up here. Make the reset, resets them all back to all. My input control window's there and I can start all over. So you get to build your own custom hierarchies this way. It is not an easy thing to do in the old universe design tool. It's much easier in the new university design tool, uh, IDT, but they would have to build it for you because most of you probably don't have a license for that, uh, for the universe development and the maintenance side. But this is this is something that I wish prompting would do very easily, but it doesn't. So we had to do it. We had to bring it all into the report viewer window and then do it locally instead. So hopefully we had other query filters up front that took care of it that way. So so there you go. That was a great question. It allowed me to throw in that particular feature. That was an, an enhancement. If you're running 4 to SP, like 3 or 4 or maybe even 5, you may not see that. I'm almost certain it was 6, but I have my little grid that uh, that I usually pull out for quick reference. So, so this is like taking prompting locally down to the report viewer level that you see right here. Okay, we do have some more questions. I don't know how you're you're okay with time, Michael. I've well, got, got a little minutes. We can do it. Yeah. I'm okay, but just want to make yep. sure. <laughs> okay. Um, can you go into more detail about defaulting a date prompt to a current date? I, I I'm not prepared to do that today because I'd have to open up the information design tool and go in uh, there and have uh, a universe that's got a date that I can in turn use it for. But it's done oh. in the information design tool very easily. Uh, I have a couple slides out of there I can pull out that show that piece of it. What it is is using the information design tool, you'd have to create a predefined filter that's a prompt. And then it follows the standard uh, construct for that prompt statement. And both tools is the same. And that would you'd have to be a universe designer, information designer to do it. If you don't have access to those tools, you wouldn't be able to do it. But, uh, okay, well, you know what? Maybe um maybe they'll want a universe design tool webinar at some well, point. And uh, yeah. <laughs> there's a there is a little evaluation that's gonna pop up after this is done, and there's a place to ask for what topics you would like for yeah. future free webinars. So if that's something that's interesting to to you all, please you know put that in. Um, and we'll try to get that to you. And what All I right. can do is, with that little piece, if you're really interested, it's very well documented in our IDT book. I can take two or three, four pages out of that one chapter. It's ten, mm. chapter 10, 11 on LOVs and parameters. And I can actually copy a couple slides out that, that show you the actual construct. So then you could go to Universe Designer and say, here, here's what you need to do. Go do it for me. I got you all the all the text you need to do it. And you can mm -hmm. have them do it for you. So. Nice. Okay. A uh, couple more. Um, my assumption is that the report level prompt will only show the data that is brought by the query level prompts. Is that correct? The report level is only going to bring in, it's only going to contain what passed the filters from your prompt level. The prompt filters up front are global at the query level. And when you run that, it's going to filter out and eliminate all those rows of data that don't meet the the selection criteria from your prompts and the resulting answer set which is your report window that i'm in right now is only going to be for those that passed all the prompt conditions remember prompt conditions it depends on ands and ors if i have more than one obviously uh if i have three or four i could and and or those combinations together different ways so you have to be careful with the and and or logic okay um let's see oh okay there's some uh just some little advices about, um, I think when you were trying to do the um, the states with C, typing in capital C percent, I don't know if it was a lowercase C, I got a couple of people just saying needs to be a capital. So maybe yeah, that was I, it. A quirky little thing I had off on that one. I do that in most of my classes. I just gotta okay. remember the, uh, the syntax. I'll, I can pop that one so I can get it back. Oh, here, and just a comment. Um, grouping here is much easier than building it at universe level and carrying it over here. Absolutely. If you're in the universe design tool, you would actually have to build all of the values in their relationship across. So I would have had to build state, city, store in physically into the universe design tool and at the section where you build it and all those go in. All I did was link them together and it did it with the data. You saw all that I had to do by doing it at the report level. And that's one where I said, 
forget it. Do, forget about doing it at the query level. I want to bring it in locally so I, I can have more control as the end user. Mm -hmm. um, ah, okay, let's see. Um, this is about query prompts. When you use the query prompts panel to change your prompt order, why don't why won't it change the regular query filters panel to the new order? Well, as I mentioned in the introduction, because that's how the tool works. I didn't build the tool, but the problem is I have to work with it. And what we used to do until they developed that query tab for us to go to, for um, uh, we had no no way to do it other than deleting and react. It's just how the tool is. I agree with you. Why don't they just make it, if I drag them in a different order, just do them in a different order. The one thing I will yeah. warn you about is if you do have the prompts, okay, and you, you, option, you play with the optional prompt and turn it on and off, but kind of random, maybe not all in sequence, I've had that shuffle the order around, which it shouldn't do, but it did. So I just, I go to that query tab on the left side and I just reset the order there. It's just, that's what the product is. You know, I can ask the Paris guys, but it's one of those things, it's low priority for them. You know, there's other bells and whistles they, that are much mm -hmm. more important to them. Yep, and, the, and just the other part of that is, it's a nice feature, but if you share the query with someone else and they don't know about the order change on that panel, it won't it continue to use that order even if they change something on the query filter section well the only way it'll change the order in the query filter sections is if you delete it and recreate them in the correct order that's the only way so that's why i have the ability to go back here if i go back to the query panel which i have up and i go to the right here you know, it's query properties when all else fails, I can always change it in here. So it's always going to put them in the order there. It's just I can't do it here because uh, it ignores it. Once you put them in and run them, it stays in that order. So just that's how it is. So we just got to remember that's to me, that's great because that provides an easy way to do it. And then whoever's running that same document will automatically pick it up the next time they run that document. So if it's a document you're sharing with other users that are, that are running it and changing the values, the prompt values, you just have to do it, do it in here. Okay. Um, and I did actually did have one question about the training. Um, that was the last like question question about the tool. Um, so we might have another one come in and I'll definitely read it if we do. But Michael, do you mind if I just take control just for a yeah, second? I'm all set. Yeah, I'm, I, it's back to you now. Okay, all right. I'm just going to show my screen here quick since since somebody asked. Um, uh, so the two kinds of training that we have are the team training on this business objects page. It's accelerate.com slash business dash objects dash training. And um, yeah, these are just the the, oh, the classes that we have that can be customized. If you, if you have a team that needs to be trained, you can just click request pricing and it's just a short form to fill out. But if you're just a, you know one person and you need open enrollment, there's a link here for web intelligence reporting training for individuals. And it goes right down to our SAP business objects class. So this is the Webby class that's open enrollment for individuals. Um, so we're coming up in June here, June 21st to the 24th and the 29th to the 30th all half days and all you have to do is click register and fill it out and you're here in the class. <laughs> yeah, can I, let me throw something in there, Ann, real quick. Yeah, yeah. We, have, we do the basic intermediate as a bundle. I no longer offer it as well, except as a bundle because too many people would take just the basic and then they'd take shots at the product unfairly because they didn't get the other half of the puzzle. The core, the core requirements are basic intermediate because of the way we layered it. And those two days give you the, the full base to build on. And the one day advanced is truly advanced topics from multiple data providers and Excel files and free and SQL and advanced formulas and subquery any, subquery all, and all that kind of stuff. We did to half day formats and it's been phenomenal. If you've not done it, trust me, you get extra class time. I'm able to work with students after class each time if they have a question or two to follow up on. The, the half day version of it, it doesn't cost you any more to do it in a half day than you know a two half days versus a full. It's awesome because it breaks it up for you and you get your other work done. Yep, now people have loved it. So um, if you're interested in that, I would probably register sooner rather than later. Michael does draw a crowd. Um, let's see, uh, I'm not seeing any other questions, questions, but you know, if, if anyone who's still here, if you, if you think of any questions, you can get in touch. You can also uh, ask them on that little evaluation too, because we'll record everything. And oh, if, if you're interested in training, you can also say that on the little email that comes up, but please do fill it out. It's just a few minutes. We really do read everything, take everything to heart. 
And, um, you know, if you've got any ideas for other webinars that you'd like to see, my name's Anne and I manage these. And so if you've got any ideas and, you know, put them down, I'll, we'll see what we can do about getting them for you. This is this is yep. how we got the webby ones. You guys asked for them. So, and Michael is kind enough to accommodate us. So <laughs> just let us know. Great. Lots of great content in our training classes. So keep that in mind. Lots of great detailed documentation and best practice guides and all that. A number of you out there have been through my training. You know how, how good it is. We're now working, we're, we've got the 4.3 new version, which is a year down the road. That's already done for anybody that might be jumping the gun for the newer version. I recommend you not until you're getting closer to reality, but our 4.2 stuff is current through SP8, really SP7, because there's no enhancements in 8. And uh, yeah, you can always drop me an email if you need with questions, any technical questions, whatever, I'll look into the one wildcard. I just gotta get the one example back up for that. Oh yeah, 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 that'll be fine. Um, all right, well, Michael, thank you so much for doing this again. And thank, thank thanks everyone who, who joined us today. Oh, you know what, we got, what, <laughs> sorry, could you do one more question? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Okay, you're the best. All right, when you run a report and go back and make changes to the query, is there a way to run the first report again to capture any added data? You can only run at the query level. So if you go back to the query panel, you have to rerun the query if you've made any changes, you know, but it's not based on each report. It's based on what's on those reports and where do they come from. If you had two queries that you brought in and you have a report on a tab that's got two different sets of objects on that same report block, okay, you're gonna have to refresh both queries because you want all the, all the columns to update from all of them. So when, when you refresh at the query level, it updates everything on the report side associated with it. It's not dependent on which tab it's on you know, what you call a sheet in Excel. It's, it, it updates at the query level when you do a refresh. And everything in the document's gonna update that's associated with that query when you, when you run or refresh that query. Okay, but it won't add the objects that you added. Oh, it never does. It's never done that. What, years ago on the old desktop product, if you ran a query and you picked, let's see, you selected state and store name, and that was it. Then you went back to, and you ran it, you got your report, then you went back to the query panel, then you added in year and quarter and maybe sales rep, and you rerun the query again. When you rerun it, you're back in the report viewer window. On the left side, your available objects tab with all the available objects, but it did not automatically put those new ones on the report tab. And there's a reason for that. It's a good reason. What if I had four report tabs, all right? And I just went back to the query panel, added four more in. Webby's wouldn't know where to put it. Which tab do I go to? Which report? So what you have to do is whenever you add to a query that's been previously run, it always retrieves the objects and puts them in available objects, and it never puts them in the report automatically, because where would it go? Which tab or tabs? What if there's more than one? It, it wouldn't know. So it's just one of those things you have to learn. I, I stress it in our training class. Remember, oh, you added that in new. Remember the original query? You didn't have it. So you just drag it into the report viewer using your control or shift key to multi-select. And you can drag one or more of the new objects anywhere on any report block that you have out there. That's right. all it's yeah. Jonathan says, okay, thanks. Just making sure I wasn't missing a way to add the object. So no, it doesn't look like <laughs> you missed anything. Just how it works. Yep. Great. All right. I think that's it. Um, thank you again, Michael, so much. Uh, thank and you. thank you everyone who, who spent this, uh, hour and about 15 with us. Um, we know you've got a lot of things going on. So we're really grateful that you were here. And thank you again, Michael. That was great. Really appreciate it. Um, thank you. Yeah, everyone have a wonderful day and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye, everyone.